And everyone, welcome to Metropolitan Hospital for today's City Hall off-site hearing of mental health and hospitals. We just have a few ground rules. If you have a cell phone, please put it on silent or vibrate at this time. All private conversations, we ask you to please take outside of the hearing room. If you have any questions or you need any assistance, raise your hand. One of the sergeant at arms will be happy to assist you. We are going to start momentarily. Good afternoon, we're calling this meeting to order. So good afternoon, I am Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction. I would like to thank you for attending and making time for us this afternoon. <coughs> this hearing will focus on the steps that the city is taking to ensure that New Yorkers from all walks of life have equitable access to psychiatric care in our hospitals in the future. This issue has special resonance for me because the situation in my community is so challenging. Statistics from the OHMH show that East Harlem has the highest rate of psychiatric hospitalizations of any neighborhood in the city. Let that sit in. And suicide is the second leading cause of death among Latina adolescents, according to the New York State Office of Mental Health. In recent years, health and hospitals have seen a 20% increase in hospitalizations of patients with mental illness, and public hospitals designate a greater share of their beds for psychiatric services than voluntary hospitals do. As we examine the ways in which we, our city can move forward to a more sustainable distribution of care, it is important to note that Thrive NYC, the mayor's $800 million mental health initiative, will have a significant role to play. We hope to achieve a greater understanding of the ways in which the public hospital system is coordinating with agencies to provide services and to identify areas where funding can best meet public needs. I am excited to hear from experts in medicine, behavioral health, and public policy, and I am confident that we will make strides today in building a better system. In closing, I would like to thank Metropolitan Hospital for hosting us, as they have played an instrumental role in providing mental health services to East Harlem residents. I would also like to thank committee staff, Council Sylvester Yavana, policy analyst Michael Kurtz, finance analyst Jeanette Merrill, and my legislative director Bianca Almedina for making this hearing possible. Finally, I would also like to recognize committee members that have joined us, Council members Fernando Cabrera, Alika Samuels, Adam Samuels, <laughs> Carlina Rivera, uh, Jimmy Van Brenner, and Council Member Holden. Carlina. Thank you, Diana. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Hospitals Committee. Today, the committee is holding a hearing to examine the future of psychiatric care in New York City's hospital. And of course, I would like to start off by thanking Metropolitan Hospital for hosting us here today and want to congratulate Metropolitan and all of the hospital staff, doctors, nurses, administrators, facility staff, everyone for recently receiving an A grade for hospital safety from a national patient safety watchdog. <laughs> Health and Hospitals is responsible for 43% of all inpatient care for mental health in New York City. 
This crucial work is being conducted against the backdrop of future federal and state cuts to funding that helps cover the cost of caring for the uninsured, known as disproportionate share hospital funding, or DISH funding. Since the majority of H&H's DISH funding comes from what remains after the state distributes fixed funding amounts to all hospitals, including voluntary hospitals, as DISH funding is cut, little will be left over for H&H. Meanwhile, nearly one million city residents remain uninsured and our public hospital system treats a large proportion of these individuals. And yet, in the midst of this tightening fiscal context, it appears that H&H's role as the primary provider of inpatient care for mental health in New York City is set to increase in the years ahead. According to a report released by the Independent Budget Office, IBO, in, Jul in July of 2017, mental health hospitalizations <laughs> at the 11 hospitals that comprise H&H grew from 20,550 in 2009 to 24,705 in 2014, which is an increase of roughly 20%. Over the same six-year period, mental health hospitalizations decreased by approximately 5% among the voluntary hospitals in New York City. Mental health hospitalizations comprise just 3.5% of all hospitalizations in private hospitals, compared to 12.9% at H&H. The committee looks forward to hearing about the strategies H&H is pursuing to cope with increasing demand for inpatient mental health services and how H&H is preparing to provide an even greater share of inpatient mental health services in the city in the context of ongoing fiscal constraints and the loss of psychiatric treatment beds in volunteer hospitals. The committee would also like to examine the role of voluntary hospitals in addressing these critical concerns. Tackling this difficult problem is crucial to maintaining the viability of our great public hospital system. I want to thank everyone here for making it to El Barrio today. A very, very special thanks to uh, Council Member Ayala for hosting us in her home hospital and for all the work that she has done uh, around mental health and behavioral health. And of course, to all the staff here for your accommodations, I know that we are guests and we want you to know that you have friends in City Hall who really want to support your work. I think being here in this hospital has always been something that I've talked about in every single one of my hearings or interviews because I think bringing visibility is so, so important to our public health system. These facilities, these 11 hospitals throughout our city all look different, they're all vibrant, they're all busy. And I think that bringing these hearings here is important to show the faces of the people doing the work and the faces of the patients that we need to take care of. So I want to thank everyone um, for being here and of course to my fellow colleagues at the City Council. And now we will be uh, taking testimony. And I want to acknowledge Council Member Mark Levine. <laughs> okay. Hello. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So uh, we're going to administer the oath. Um, to you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to Council Member questions? Yes, I do. Okay. You may begin. So good afternoon, Chairperson Rivera and Chairperson Ayala, and members of the Committee on Hospital Systems and the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. I'm Dr. Charles Barron. I'm the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for New York City Health and Hospitals, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify before you on the future of psychiatric care in New York City's hospital infrastructure. Health and Hospitals is the main provider of behavioral health and inpatient psychiatric care services in New York City, with nearly 1,500 licensed psychiatric beds representing 48% of all psychiatric inpatient beds in the metropolitan area. As such, we provide a significant portion of the behavioral health inpatient services in New York City, which underscores the need for continued stability in the public hospital system. Over the last several years, healthcare delivery in New York State has been undergoing a transformation, a shift from providing care in the inpatient 
setting to community-based care. In April 2014, the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, approved New York State's Medicaid waiver request in the amount of $8 billion over five years. The goal of the Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment, or DISRIP, program was to achieve a 25 percent reduction in avoidable hospitalizations for Medicaid patients, including psychiatric hospitalizations, and restructure the health care delivery system. To that end, from 2014 to 2017, Health and Hospitals has seen a decrease in our all-cause and psychiatric readmission rates by 24 and 27 percent, respectively. In keeping with the hospital industry's shift from inpatient to ambulatory care at Health and Hospitals, we are in the process of deploying a system-wide and multi-phase expansion of integrated ambulatory behavioral health care, which we expect to complete by the end of 2020. New York City Hospital Metropolitan will serve as a demonstration site and a center for innovation, bringing together the most innovative care models and community-driven <laughs> strategies. Additional and complementary initiatives will also include collaboration with community-based providers focusing on depression, substance misuse, unstable psychosis, and neighbors especially impacted by behavioral <laughs> health programs. Also, strategies to improve safety for our patients, intensive outpatient programs which allow increased frequency and customized treatment to meet the patient's needs, and the use of telepsychiatry to assist with workforce shortages and provide increased access for patients. Our acute care behavioral health services include seven adult and one child and adolescent comprehensive psychiatric emergency programs, or CPEPs, which include psychiatric emergency rooms, extended observation beds, mobile crisis intervention services, and access to crisis beds. Last year, there were more than 63,000 adult and 8,000 child and adolescent visits to health and hospital psychiatric emergency rooms. Our inpatient services provide individualized therapeutic care to stabilize mental illness episodes, promote rehabilitation and recovery, and a return to the community and less restrictive modalities of care. As previously acknowledged, while inpatient care will always be needed, especially for those with serious and persistent mental illness, acute psychosis, or are at risk for suicide, we agree with the imperative to keep patients out of the hospital if they don't need to be there. Health and Hospitals provides a comprehensive array of ambulatory behavioral health care. These include mobile crisis teams, outpatient clinics, day treatment programs, partial hospital programs, and case management mental health programs. For those patients who require significant levels of support, our facilities also operate assertive community teams, treatment teams, or ACT teams. These ACT teams programs function as clinic without walls, treating individuals in their homes or in the community. Of the 38 ACT teams in New York City, Health and Hospitals operates 12 of these teams. Children and adolescents receive services through developmental evaluation clinics, family support programs, adolescent treatment programs, school-based programs, and outpatient clinics. Harmful substance use is a significant population health problem in New York City and among health and hospitals patients. There are approximately 90,000 unique patients with substance use disorders at health and hospitals every year. Approximately 20 percent of primary care patients are at moderate risk of harmful substance use, or SUD. Of the patients with substance use disorders, close to 15 percent have a primary diagnosis of opioid use disorder, and 45 percent have a primary diagnosis of alcohol use disorder. Health and hospitals facilities provide an extensive array of substance use disorder services. Inpatient detoxification is provided in seven facilities, and we have 13 outpatient counseling programs, four methadone treatment programs, two halfway houses, and a number of specialized services for families, adolescents, and women. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 2017, the mayor and first lady announced Healing NYC, a comprehensive effort to reduce opioid overdose by 35 percent over the next five years. Health and Hospitals is a key partner in this initiative, 
reinforcing our commitment to transform into a system of excellence for opioid services. We are grateful to the city for providing nearly $5 million in funding to date, which has allowed us to implement several initiatives, including first, hospital-based opioid overdose prevention programs. 17 of our patient care sites are now state-certified opioid overdose prevention programs that routinely dispense naloxone based on best practices, including overdose prevention training of patients and community members. This unified strategy for naloxone distribution will enable health and hospitals to capture system-wide data to target future overdose prevention work. Second, we've established consultation for addiction treatment and care in hospitals teams, or as we call them, CATCH teams. To maximize patient connections to substance use care in the full fall, health and hospitals will initially launch CATCH at four hospitals, Bellevue, Metropolitan, Lincoln, and Coney Island, soon followed by Elmhurst and Woodhull in 2019. We will specifically recruit staff to form interdisciplinary teams that will engage patients with substance use disorders who are in the hospital for any condition. The program targets is to reach out and deliver treatment to more than 8,000 patients with opioid use disorder per year across the six hospitals. Third, buprenorphine expansion in primary care. In order to treat as many possible patients with opioid use disorder across our system, Health and Hospitals is expanding me medication for addiction treatment in primary care clinics. By 2020, we will have increased the number of providers to 450 who are certified to prescribe buprenorphine. Through our efforts, the number of patients who receive medication treatment in our system will increase to 2,500 over the next three years. Integrating primary care with behavioral health and substance use treatment in this way will increase access to treatment and enable primary care providers to better serve the patient population. Fourth, we've established emergency department peer advocates addressing substance use. Leveraging an initiative launched by the New York Alliance for Careers in Healthcare and the City University of New York at Queensborough Community College, which trains and certifies peer advocates. Health and Hospitals created an integrated substance use disorder and care management peer counselor program in three of its emergency departments with the highest volume of substance use disorder patients, Harlem, Metropolitan, and Woodhull. Using a relational care model, peer advocates engage with patients coming to the emergency department and connect them to appropriate ongoing addiction care. This program will be rolled out to the remaining eight emergency departments in the next year. Finally, of this program, there is judicious prescribing training and guidance. To ensure that all possible prevention strategies are implemented, a total of 2,220 providers across health and hospitals received education and training in judicious opioid prescribing in 2017. Judicious prescribing means prescribing smaller doses of opioid analgesics for shorter durations and avoiding co-prescriptions with benzodiazepines which can increase the patient's risk for overdose. Additionally, prescribers will receive reminders through Health and Hospital's electronic health record system to ensure fidelity to these prescribing <coughs> guidelines. In 2015, the mayor and first lady announced Thrive NYC, a plan of action to guide New York City to effectively and holistically support the mental health of its residents. With over $3 million in funding to date, Health and Hospitals have implemented a number of programs in the Thrive initiatives. First, universal maternal depression screening. As part of the Thrive initiatives, all prenatal and postpartum patients seen at Health and Hospitals are screened for depression. Mothers are screened in both the OBGYN and pediatric clinics during well baby visits. Anyone screened positive for possible depression is then connected to ongoing mental health care. As part of this work, Health and Hospitals participates in the city's Maternal Depression Collaborative run by the Greater New York Hospital Association and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Second, we participate in the New York City Mental Health Corps. 30 Mental Health Service Corps members, all recently graduated masters and doctoral level clinicians, work in substance use programs, mental health clinics, and primary care practices within health and hospitals. 
When fully staffed, the Corps throughout the city will provide approximately 400,000 additional hours of service in the communities where they are needed most, including at primary care settings, which is where most New Yorkers receive their regular medical care. Third, the mental health services in all family justice centers. Health and hospitals expanded on-site mental health services at all five of the city's family justice centers, which last year served more than 37,000 domestic violence survivors. The staff provide direct care and also offer mental health support, skill building opportunities, and mentoring to other family justice centers, justice center staff. This new program will enable to accommodate 1,000 clients per year. And fourth, the mental health first aid. This groundbreaking public education program teaches the skill needed to identify, understand, and respond to signs of mental health and substance use challenges and crises. Thus far, 826 health and hospitals employees have been trained and certified. The course gives people the skills to help someone who is developing a mental health problem or experiencing a mental health crisis and help guide them to treatment programs. The evidence behind the program demonstrate the individuals who have completed the mental health first aid training have a greater confidence in providing health to others, a likelihood of advising people to seek professional help, an improved concordance with health and professionals about treatment, and a decreased stigmatization attitude. Health and hospitals as the largest provider of care to individuals with mental illness and substance use disorder in New York City faces many challenges providing high quality patient-centered care. These challenges, which are not unique to us, include eliminating the stigma and discrimination associated with seeking care for the treatment of mental health and substance use disorders. A patient population that is frequently resistant to treatment and often interfaces with the criminal justice system. Significant numbers of uninsured individuals who lack resources to pay for their treatment and medication. And inadequate re reimbursement for services. Health and hospitals cannot resolve these challenges alone and will continue to partner with government and key stakeholders to forge solutions. And I will be happy to answer questions that you may have at this time. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you for listing some of the programs that you're working on in, in interagency and of course health and hospitals, what you're trying to provide for every New Yorker. So we have a few questions for you and I know there's some people here also from health and hospitals that may assist you with answering questions. Okay, great. So um, you spoke especially at the, at the tail end of your testimony about social determinants and stigma. And I wanted to ask about intersectionality between social determinants and mental health. And so how does the intersection between mental health and other social determinants impact a person's likelihood to need inpatient care? So their experience is receiving care and their discharge planning. And, and I just want to also ask, has there been an increase in need for a particular community when it comes to this, such as young adults or those experiencing homelessness or those who are incarcerated? So certainly I think that many of the social determinants of health uh, and those specifically that you mentioned such as homelessness uh, seriously impact uh, the ability of someone to be in treatment and to remain in treatment. It's very hard if you're homeless and seeking uh, your primary basic needs to be met uh, oftentimes to go to treatment and be in treatment uh, for mental health services. So I think that that group particularly has a difficult time uh, complying with mental health treatment. Uh, I think that's why that we have been developing so many of, many of the other services, such as our mobile treatment, uh, the ACT teams, our mobile crisis teams, and looking to develop further teams that will be providing ongoing uh, treatment in the community where it would be easier for people with, that are homeless and have other uh, issues and problems to seek treatment. Certainly the issues of uh, involvement with the criminal justice center system also complicates more treatment. But fortunately, uh, there have been additional treatment resources that are also being provided to that particular group too. So how are your facilities assessing and then providing services for these particular needs? Uh, our facilities as well as the system in general collects a lot of information and data related to uh, certainly to homelessness. Uh, to mental illness, the diagnoses, the needs of patients. 
uh, and uh, their, their discharge plans and where they're going and, and where the gaps look at. What do you think could be done better to meet the needs of the patients who require support in addition to the behavioral health services in terms of looking at it comprehensively and holistically? Well, certainly I think that one of the biggest areas that uh, the mental health system has, is facing at this point in time has to do with our homeless population. And I think that there are certainly a number of efforts that are being um, put forward for the homeless, a lot of projects. I certainly think the increase in affordable housing for the mental illness and uh, substance using uh, mental ill patients would be a tremendous help to be able to get them into stable housing. Uh, I think there are other programs being developed uh, in a sense of looking at how to provide uh, better mental health services uh, in areas where they are, sometimes in the shelters, sometimes uh, on the street, but I think that that's one of the areas that really I think is a big focus is, is affordable housing. Are there any updates on the development of additional long-term mental health care facilities in the city? whether they're part of the 11 acute system or whether they're smaller or part of the Gotham Health Center network? Is there any, are you looking to increase behavioral health capacity and, and services? Actually, yes. One of our big focuses is to increase uh, access and capacity of our, our mental health services and substance use disorder services. That's one of the reasons for the shift toward ambulatory care that we've seen uh, have been successful. Uh, there certainly will always be a need for some inpatient beds that we will need for acute crises, et cetera. But if we're able to engage uh, our patients uh, into appropriate level services in the ambulatory care area, uh, where there is a longer term stability and better mental health, uh, that would be better. We're certainly looking at developing uh, different types of services uh, that provide more needs, more community-based services. Uh, we're in putting in intensive outpatient programs, IOPs we call them, that will increase access and allow patients to uh, actually attend clinics uh, multiple times a week, uh, sometimes having several services uh, in one day, which makes it more convenient for them to attend and get, you know, perhaps seeing the doctor, getting medication, getting <coughs> therapy, attending a group, all within the same day. Uh, we are looking at also expanding, uh, in a sense, some of our, um, how we do some of our inpatient treatment to, there are certain special needs patients that may need longer term care, so we're looking at how we will to be provide that, uh, while maybe they are uh, being hooked up with appropriate housing. So are the wait times long for uh, an appointment at H&H? &H? What, what are the current wait times for a psychiatric visit at one of your facilities now? And do you expect with the look to increase capacity that they'll be shorter? Our current average uh, wait time, you, we usually measure by what's called the third next available appointment. It's a standard measure of that. Uh, our current uh, third next available appointment date is between four to six days. However, we have developed capacity within our, our, our clinics and our programs that if someone has an urgent need for that, we can give them same-day appointments. We are uh, continuing to address the access issues and actually moving down uh, to hopefully to within one, one in two days. And we are moving forward toward that. Okay, I have a few more questions, but I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues and first okay. I'll go to Chair Ayala. Is the outpatient wait of one or two, is that for outpatient, the one or two day uh, waiting period? That is our goal ultimately for all of our ambulatory care facilities. That is the goal, but yes. It, some of them are there one or two days. Uh, some of them are at three or four days, but our average is around three to four days. Um, but as I said, if someone is in need of an urgent appointment, our facilities are able to give someone a same day or next day appointment for that, yes. Now, could you explain um, the, uh, the thought process behind providing more ambulatory care as opposed to inpatient for psyche, uh, psychiatry? Because I you know, am the, the, the sibling of a person with mental illness, and I struggled you know, with the system for quite some time. Um, my, uh, my, my brother was hospitalized several times, and I felt almost like I had to literally fight to get him admitted because when I brought him in, 
the symptoms that he was presenting, and I use the quotation marks because these are the symptoms that he wanted to present at the moment, did not seem like symptoms that would create a situation where he was harmful to himself or to the public when I knew different, as a, as a, as a, a person that was observing you know, specific behavior that was dangerous in nature. So I, my concern is that patients will come into emergency psych and they will be evaluated but because they're not presenting at the moment um, that they will be discharged with an appointment to come back for ambulatory care. Is there a follow-up you know, uh, to that? What happens if the person doesn't show up? I have a couple of questions, so if you can kind of walk me through okay. that process. Sure. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, it's a very um, traumatic time when anyone with a mental illness needs uh, goes into an acute state. Uh, it's a traumatic time for that person, the patient themselves, and it's a traumatic time for family members that, that, that have to support them and, 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 and trying to do the best thing that they can. So it's a very difficult process. I certainly understand some of your, your difficulties that you've gone through. Um, we certainly have a process where we try to make the best assessment when someone comes into, whether it's the emergency room or to a urgent clinic or a clinic visit, uh, presenting with uh, potentially acute symptoms or, or behaviors. We do as comprehensive and as full assessment as we possibly can using all the information that we can gather. Uh, certainly from the patient themselves and the physicians, the psychiatrists certainly are able to do you know, the mental status examination of the patient, review history, uh, et cetera. Uh, we make every effort to, uh, with, with any patient, to include uh, information from families, from people who are their support system, live with them, know them, watch, know their behaviors, uh, other treatment providers if they're not in our system, uh, because we really want to make the best decision. Our, our goal is to provide the best care. Our goal is to uh, be responsive to uh, the people that come to, to serve to, to us to, for service uh, to do the best job we can. Uh, sometimes we may miss something, sometimes because of confidentiality laws uh, of the state and federal uh, and the refusal of a patient to allow us to speak to a treatment provider or family members, we uh, may have some limited knowledge, but we certainly try to use every bit of knowledge we can to make the right decision as to where a person should be. Are they appropriate for an outpatient treatment? And now that we're developing more intensive outpatient treatments, uh, such as the intensive outpatient program, our partial hospital programs, sometimes people can be managed appropriately in the community, in their homes, uh, and with intensive outpatient services where they may come daily for, for a period of time to more, and more stable. Uh, if we find that it's appropriate for them to be an inpatient, then we uh, would take appropriate steps, hopefully with the, the voluntary cooperation of the patient uh, for that. Uh, we make every effort to make a, an appropriate and safe discharge for that patient. Uh, we want to make sure they have been stabilized uh, and are ready to return to the community uh, and to an appropriate level of care. We use oftentimes our partial hospitals and our, our intensive outpatient programs as step downs from the from the um, inpatient service because we realize that sometimes going from a, a more daily acute inpatient setting to a traditional outpatient clinic may be too big of a, a jump for, for the person to make. So we do have these other treatment programs that are able to provide an intermediate and a step down uh, type of treatment. Again, my, my, my concern is when, when we're giving appointments and mm -hmm. people don't show up. So you give an appointment oh and I decide that I don't want to go because I believe that the medication you're giving me is poisoning my body and it's not in the best interest of my body to ingest it, so I'm not going to I'm not gonna go to the hospital. And then a few weeks later, the person is readmitted um, with presenting symptoms. What happens then? So I think that some of the services that we have been starting to put in place and put in place, I mean, that has been one of the, of the dilemmas that the mental health system both health and hospitals and, and anyone else has faced in the sense that uh, it's oftentimes challenging for uh, the patients that, that use our services with, with mental illnesses or substance use disorders uh, to have full insight into some of their problems and what is going on. Uh, as you mentioned, sometimes they feel the medication is wrong or poison or something of that nature. Uh, what we have been doing uh, is to, we reach out to the person 
Uh, we have follow-up workers who actually contact uh, to see if they've been made an appointment. They contact the, the patient themselves, uh, reminding them of the appointment uh, and to check to see if they've made the appointment. If for some reason they are not making the appointment, we try to make another appointment, engage them. Uh, at times we need to, we will refer the appointment if they're not making the appointment to one of our mobile crisis teams to go out and assess the person in, the, in their environment, in their home, uh, to see if they can help stabilize the person more, engage them, and keep them that. We're also instituting uh, the use of um, peers or consumers that are now trained in, in peer advocacy. Uh, we find that this is a very successful means of trying to help uh, patients with mental illness and substance use disorders to engage in treatment. Uh, certainly, it's very important that you go to treatment, that you take your medication, that you follow the treatment plan. And so we are really uh, rolling out a lot of peer advocates that, because they seem to have been very successful in helping people make that transition into uh, ambulatory care and actually to engage and go to treatment uh, to take their medication. And so we are really focused on making every effort we can in trying to help the person engage in an appropriate level of treatment. Can you tell us what is the capacity of beds in H&H &H, um, hospitals right now for psychiatric care beds? We have a total of uh, 1,499 beds. 1,400, and on the, are they underutilized? Uh, no, they're, they're utilized. They're all utilized. We're, yes. I mean, we're, we're, our, our average occupancy rate is around, uh, which varies from day to day, month to month, around 90%. How, what is the, the length of time that a, a patient is usually in hospital? Our current average length of stay is uh, 18 days. 18 days? Yes. That's the average. Are any of those hospitalizations as a result of Kendra's law? I'm sorry, pardon? Are any of those hospitalizations related in any way to Kendra's law? Uh, there certainly potentially are. Uh, if someone is considered to be dangerous and sometimes because of the Kendra's laws and other things are brought to our uh, emergency rooms that we assess them to be dangerous, uh, et cetera, or in, uh, acutely with acute symptoms, uh, then they would be hospitalized, yes. Do you have any data that suggests how many patients have been admitted because of that law? I don't have that data with me right now, but I can certainly get back to you with that information. I would appreciate it. And my final question before I let my colleagues, um, in terms of homeless outreach, um, a lot of money is being um, allocated to doing outreach. How does, what does mental health look like when you're living under a bridge? It's, that's a, as I sort of mentioned before, that's one of the huge challenges, I think. It's very difficult for someone who is homeless and mentally ill uh, to be part of appropriate treatment. When you're looking for where you're going to live, where you're going to stay out of the elements, where you're going to find some food, where you're finding shelter, it's very difficult. So that's why we've really began to work with uh, the Department of Homeless Services, with a lot of community-based uh, homeless agencies, and partnering with them to try to deliver care uh, where, the, where the person is, and to try to begin to work with them toward getting in a better situation in some affordable housing. A lot of our efforts are focused with our patients who are homeless and trying to get them into housing. I, actually, I'm sorry, colleagues, I lied. I have one more question. Sure. Last, two weeks ago, we had a young woman, 11, an 11-year-old 11 child, jump off a roof in one of our public housing developments and committed suicide. Uh, apparently, there was a pact in the school, and many of the children have been watching a specific show on Netflix. Um, that followed the, the life of a, of, a, of a young woman in high school that had committed suicide. What are we doing in terms of adolescent mental health services at Metropolitan Hospital or at any, all of the H&H &H, uh, hospitals? I'm not very familiar with the type of service and how we distinguish the services between adults and children. Well, I think one of the problems, suicide is certainly a very significant and, and worrisome and difficult problem. Uh, and as the acute care providers for people who may be con contemplating suicide, uh, we certainly take that very seriously. We provide anyone that walks in or comes in in any way to any one of our portals of entry, whether it be the emergency room, the clinics, uh, at our inpatient service, everywhere, we uh, really do a comprehensive assessment 
using uh, evidence-based uh, tools for suicide assessment and risk assessment uh, to really determine what is the risk of suicide for that person so that we can provide the best level of care. People that are considered at risk of suicide, we provide uh, with safety plans, work with them on developing safety plans with them and their support system, their families. Um, in our adolescent units particularly, uh, we focus a lot on, on suicide and education, about mental illness, about depression, about suicide. Um, we work in our school-based programs uh, and other, wherever we treat the adolescents, really with a lot of places to, to provide not only the treatment, but in a sense, in a sense of the education uh, of them about the potential hazards and, and thinking about suicide and what reality of suicide is. Is that part of the primary care um, assessment? So if a child is coming yeah. in with a parent, are you having this discussion and maybe making this information available? Yes, every, even in primary care or pediatrics, <clears throat> absolutely, we are assessing through our collaborative care program uh, the, for evidence of depression and, and especially for, for suicide risk. Thank you. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Moya. And we want to get to some of the questions of our colleagues, so we are going to start with Councilmember Mark Levine. Okay. Thank you to both of our chairs for holding uh, a hearing on such an important topic, and, and I'm, we're just so lucky to have both of you in, in these important leadership roles uh, and these two vital committees. Um, <coughs> I, I want to acknowledge just how much h, &H is doing in behavioral health. You said you have 48% of behavioral health beds citywide. I think in terms of services provided, maybe patient visits, it's over 50%. I could be wrong about that. Which means, in other words, you are providing more behavioral health services in the city than every other institution combined. Uh, and that's partly because, um, to be blunt, there's not a lot of money to be made in behavioral health. And you're doing it because the city needs you to do it, but we just want you to know how grateful we are, we are for that. If you stop doing that service, it would be disastrous for the health of the city. Um, and I do think that, therefore, the city government should be um, supporting you with funding. And I don't think we do much of that. Um, do you know how much direct city money comes into uh, your operation, behavioral health services, system-wide? I do not know the total amount. Uh, I know certain particular programs and stuff, I don't know that, but I can get you that information and definitely will. I, I'm told that out of the Thrive uh, Initiative, which is 800 million all told, 10 million of that is coming into H&H. &H. Does that sound right? Yes, that's right. For Thrive, yes. I'm not looking to divert money from any other great H&H &H priorities, but I got to say that doesn't sound like a lot, considering the scale of the work that you're doing. And so I would certainly be an advocate working with our chairs. Uh, to look at how the city could inject money into your work that would up the quality of care, um, whether it's in staffing or other services that would impact patients. We ultimately care, first and foremost, about, uh, about their well-being. Um, so I'd love to continue that conversation with you. Sure. Thank you. Um, uh, you talked a lot, and actually this has been a big priority for the council, about the opioid crisis. And uh, I was particularly happy to see you speak about um, this new class of alternative, uh, medication alternatives like buprenorphine, mm -hmm. um, which far too few New Yorkers are receiving. It's, it's preferable to methadone in many, many ways. Um, it may not be right for everybody, for, for, but for many people it avoids having to show up to a methadone clinic every day and the travel time and the waiting in line and sometimes the indignity of that. Um, uh, to be able to have a prescription that you can self-administer at home. Uh, it's just a more humane option, um, but there are major barriers uh, to the people who can prescribe this that are put on us by the federal government. They're, they're really, in my opinion, um, completely indefensible, but we're stuck with them because it's federal. So you identified a goal by 2020 to have 450 prescribers in your system. Um, but we're a long way from that today, right? How many, how many prescribers do you have today throughout the system? Uh, today we have 130 um, ex-waivered prescribers uh, and we have 110 uh, waiting, trained and waiting for the actual uh, approval document from SAMHSA, which should be coming through within the next 30 days. 
So we That's actually more than I had heard in a recent uh, hearing. Uh, the last update I had, it was 65. So you, you're, you're making uh, a lot of progress, it sounds like. Yes, we actually are really taking advantage of the training, our physicians. Uh, we have been providing, we're actually going to be providing another class uh, next month uh, for another large group of the h, &H providers. Uh, because this is one of our goals, is really to increase the access, and particularly in primary care where people go get their health care system, you know, their, uh, their treatment, uh, and it makes access more easy, uh, it decreases stigma, uh, and makes them more willing to, to come yes. and, and do that. That's great. Well, we, 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 we want to continue to push you and the medical system around the city to get more people qualified to, make, to get the waiver to make these prescriptions. But the other side of this equation is we need patients who are suffering with opioid addiction also to seek out this treatment. And you talked about the role of peers, um, which I think is, is so important. They have a unique role to play in supporting patients. Uh, are, were you referring to the Relay program? This is uh, an initiative that is placed uh, it's funding peers in emergency rooms and maybe other medical professionals so that if someone comes in with a non-fatal overdose, they're told about buprenorphine and they're, they're guided to an appointment, et cetera. Actually, our program is different from, it's similar but in function, but different from the relay program. We are in talks with uh, uh, DOHMH about having their relay program be a supplement to ours, but basically our peers uh, that we've put and are putting in all of our emergency departments uh, not only see the non-fail overdoses of opioids, but uh, we do screening uh, when people come into the emergency department uh, for potential substance use disorders, uh, particularly opiates uh, as part of our history taking and our screening process. Uh, people with uh, identified as opiate users, uh, we actually, that's where the peers go and have conversations with them, uh, really advise them about options for them, buprenorphine, other treatments, uh, in order to, to, to do that. So it's a broader program. It also goes beyond the uh, opiate users and to another significant uh, issues in our emergency departments and, and the alcohol users. But so so that, that's great. So every patient in every H and H facility who comes in with a non-fatal overdose is screened for bup and similar class of drugs. Anyone with a non-fatal overdose is certainly identified. Yes, uh, but the pro our program goes beyond. It, you may have come in for a, a, a non not an overdose situation, but another medical situation, uh, and we uh, are able to screen and determine that you're also using opiates, right. then our, you will be flagged for the peer advocates to, have, to go con talk and consult and, and talk with them about options of getting off of opiates. Right, so you, you said everyone's identified, and so, sorry to be uh, parsing words on this, but so ev everyone who comes in with a non-fatal overdose in any H&H &H facility uh, is screened for whether these medication alternatives are appropriate, and if so, uh, this is explained to the patient, Yes. and uh, a prescription is offered, or they are um, guided to an appointment with a specialist? We, anybody with an overdose or an opioid problem uh, is seen by the peers and evaluated by the treatment team, and uh, if, if they choose to go on to the buprenorphine now, we are making available the ability to do buprenorphine induction in our emergency departments and then refer to continued uh, buprenorphine treatment. Okay. Uh, I do think it's important that we have peers, perhaps paired with a medical professional, who not only inform the patient that this is available, okay. but serve as a guide to make sure that they get to the appointment where it's prescribed, where they get to the pharmacy where it's dispensed. Mm -hmm. um, so someone's checking in with them to make sure that they're taking the medicine as instructed, to make sure they come for a follow-up appointment. Um, when, when, when a human being is present to help offer guidance through that process, the results are dramatically better. And as you pointed out, peers have a special, I think, a special power in, in those scenarios. And I just want to make sure that every patient who needs it gets that kind of guidance. 
That's our goal too. Okay. And we do follow up with the peers, uh, you know, after they leave the emergency department, uh, the peers, including our other peer case managers uh, in our system, follow up with the person to sort of continue to give them that support uh, to make sure they go for their appointments and, and offer them support during that transition process. Great. Okay. Thank you for allowing me uh, so much time on the questions to both of my chairs. And thank you, sir. Before I turn it over to Councilmember Cabrera, I do want to recognize we've been joined by Councilmember Antonio Reynoso. And I want to just a quick follow up to what Councilmember Levine had mentioned, because in your testimony you said by 2020 we will have increased the number of providers to 450 who are certified to prescribe buprenorphine. Do you, do you have a citywide target in mind of the number of doctors or number of people who should be able to prescribe this? whether it's in your system or in the voluntary system, you have a target of 450. What should we be looking to push and encourage citywide from all medical providers? I, th I think that may be much more of a, a question that uh, our Department of Health, Mental Hygiene may have more information. I don't think I have enough data information to really give you that appropriate estimate. I know within our system, our minimum goal is 450. Okay, I appreciate that. Okay, Council Member Cabrera. Thank you so much to both of the chairs. Uh, Doctor, welcome. Thank you for your testimony. I wanted to uh, backtrack a little bit here in terms of the waiting time you were referring to, five to six days. Is this uh, for mental health issues or for substance abuse issues? Uh, our substance abuse issues are, are basically available same day. Uh, we really have been setting up a lot of problems. We realize the, the, the issues and difficulty, if a person is ready for that treatment, you need to move on that immediately. You don't need to wait. But let's say if I wanted to go to a detox, because I, I haven't heard in the whole testimony the other option, which used to be a popular one. Uh, now we just want to substitute one drug for another one, and you know, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's indicative of what we need yes. to do, but uh, if I wanted to go through detox, uh, what's my waiting time? You can, if you come into our system, our emergency room, our uh, clinic area, for, and you are in need of detox, you can be admitted that day. Because, you know, when I talk to nurses, uh, they tell me that they're frustrated. They're frustrated because somebody comes in and and they're not readily admitted. And so what I hear often, you know, sometimes even unsolicited, I, you know, I don't solicit the, the question in terms of please let me know what's going on inside. They come and they tell me, hey, uh, you know, people come and the worst thing for us is that we have to tell them we don't have a bed. Uh, so, this is what I'm being told on the ground floor. Uh, I, is, is this, uh, how do you, I mean, can you explain me why we have such a gap of perception here? I know that we do have access for detox. If, say, there might be a, a case where for that particular day there's no beds, if someone needs detox, we don't turn them away, they would be held you know, in our emergency department, uh, starting the detox at that point in time and then moved up uh, as soon as there was a bed available. We don't turn people away, especially related to detox, uh, if that is what they need and they're looking for that. I think one of the things that we are also doing uh, is to, uh, there are many different ways of providing the appropriate service of detox and sometimes the inpatient service is not the, the only way, a lot of people could be detoxed in an ambulatory setting with a lot of extra support. Uh, we are certainly looking to, to provide other stabilization programs so that uh, that even increases the ability for people to enter uh, the detox and or substance use disorder programs. So getting back to the five or six days, this is meant, uh, mainly for mental health related issues? Those are, that's mainly the, the mental health clinic. Uh, then that's a very average across our entire system. As I said, and, and generally we are able to, if you are in need of services, we will make sure that you have access to services, uh, you know, same day or within one day, okay. uh, depending on the urgency of the, the difficulty and problem. 
uh, and uh, we you know, continue to drop that average length of uh, wait time. So if it's five or six days, in order to be an average of five or six days, there are people who might be waiting 10 days. That could be possible. Do you find but that to be a bit too long? Yes, I do, and that's why we, are, we have active programs to really reduce uh, and improve, improve access and reduce that wait and time. And how many more uh, service providers I mean, to help service providers, they're going to have to hire in order to bring that to same day. I'm not average. sure about the, the number of, of people. I think it's uh, also sometimes other issues besides uh, the number of providers, but we are certainly actively looking at, at that as we, we to continue to drop that length, that length of stay, absolutely. Do you feel that we have, uh, I guess I hear, uh, you're going to have to hire many more mental health providers. Do you feel that we have enough social workers out there and mental health? Do you hire licensed mental health counselors? Yes, we do. You do. Do you feel that uh, we have uh, enough to pull to hire from in the city? As you know, there's, you probably know, there's a national shortage of mental health professionals. Right. Uh, particularly psychiatrists but also other mental health professionals. Uh, we've really been engaged in an active uh, program of developing workforce, uh, partnering with uh, our city university uh, and other things for, for providing uh, access uh, to them for appropriate internships or preceptorships. Uh, we have certainly been looking at other models that aren't dependent only on psychiatrists. We are using more nurse practitioners uh, we are using more psychologists, more social workers, more licensed mental health counselors and professionals. Uh, we're looking using a lot more of these uh, alternate titles to really increase our ability to continue to provide the care and actually expand and increase that. Doctor, I'm really, really happy to hear that you're typing into licensed mental health counselors. I actually started the very first uh, master's counseling mental health program, Mercy College. Uh, and at the beginning, uh, I saw the hesitation, even though they have more intern hours and, you know, the preparation is a very good one. So I'm glad that you're tapping into uh, that licensed uh, profession. Last question uh, is related. Something that you mentioned that um, I was a little surprised to hear that you mentioned that psychiatric cases uh, their intersection with law enforcement is higher than the average, uh, the average person. Did I hear that right? Because my understanding was that uh, it, it was no higher than, I, I, maybe I heard it wrong, but please explain to me what I was. Okay. You know, I, no, the, there, between what I heard, what I thought the, I heard. There, there's not a higher than average, uh, you know, mental health uh, people with mental illness, health, mental health problems, et cetera, do not represent a higher average uh, in their interaction with law enforcement uh, than the general population. Uh, I, what I meant was that what I stated and meant was that you know it's more difficult for oftentimes for people with. Uh, that are involved with, a, with various law enforcement or criminal justice in a sense of really staying in, to, in treatment. And so that's why other kinds of programs are being developed to specialize for this particular population. But it is a subpopulation, yes. Well, thank you so much for that point of clarification, and thank you for all you do. And I do agree with my colleague. We do need more funding. We're talking about $800 million. Honestly, you need the reinforcement. And let, let me just be real. The reason why you have a five-day waiting is because of funding issue because it's all about the money. It's all about the funding, and, uh, and it starts with us here. It starts with the people on this side and people on the other side of City Hall that you, you know, often, uh, I've been doing this for nine years, coming before, you know, uh, a panel and so forth, and say, how can you not do this? And, and I, I see commissioners and everybody saying, like, I wish I could say what I'm about to say. I need more money in order to do it. And so please uh, let us know early on uh, to our chairs uh, so we could advocate uh, early on and make it part of the budget so you have, we could be your quartermasters. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you.
Thank you, Council Member Cabrera. Yes, I also want to underline that. And I know Health and Hospitals has received some funding from the Council in the, in the last budget adoption. And please let us know specifically capital requests because we want to make sure you have the best facilities to provide the best care in New York City. Uh, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Council Member Bob Holden. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Barron, for your important work and your testimony. Could you describe the uh, mobile crisis teams? Because I would think that's a very important unit to communicate with some people, with, let's say, with depression, who won't call back, and, um, and then they won't answer the phone. So how do you, what's, could you describe the, the crisis team? Sure. Um, we operate seven uh, of the city's mobile crisis teams. Uh, these, first of all, uh, I'll say the mobile crisis teams currently are not like 911 crisis response teams, but our goal is at this moment is to get there within 24 hours to the crisis. And we are working with uh, New York State Office of Mental Health and our city Department of Mental Health and Hygiene uh, to actually reduce that number through some additional uh, workforce issues. Uh, the mobile crisis teams uh, get referrals generally through the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's uh, single point of access or SPOA program. Anyone can call up, uh, family members, community members, uh, treatment resources, et cetera, can call and make a referral. Uh, and they are given to an appropriate uh, mobile crisis team in their their borough, their area, et cetera, things like that. So is it it's an ambulance uh, with a doctor? No. No. What is no. It? This is basically a mobile team, oftentimes made up, there's a doctor usually on the team. A lot of times it's made up of social workers, psychologists, sometimes nurses, uh, other mental health professionals that, that go out to do the assessment, find out what's going on, investigate the crisis, uh, make a plan of what to do. Uh, the goal sometimes is to basically try to sometimes pre provide crisis intervention services to the patient and the family uh, there to keep them in the, in the home. Uh, if it is necessary that they need hospitalization, then the, the crisis team usually calls the EMS NYPD to help escort them to the hospital. Uh, those were not an ambulance service but per se. Right. But we provide a lot of ongoing support uh, to someone. We identify a crisis, sometimes it's able to be stabilized and we'll go back several days in a row to provide ongoing crisis intervention to the person and, and or their support system uh, to keep them out of the hospital sometimes. But is it, is it an automatic, is it like the mobile crisis team, um, let's say the person, you call the person, you reach out, you call them three or four times, they don't answer the phone, they see, the hospital's calling, the caller ID, they don't want to pick it up. Right. And that happens, probably happens a lot, doesn't right. it? Right. So does, do you have like a, you sort of like, does that trigger something if you, or you just give up and just say, well, this guy doesn't need help or doesn't want help or, it, I mean, I, I would think we need more mo mobile crisis teams now because you said there are seven in the hospital? Well, there are seven in our system. There are other high mobile crisis teams uh, run by community-based organizations and other okay, so places. The there, there are many mobile crisis teams in the, in the city, uh, but we, uh, we run seven of them. And do you, um, when, so, but do you have, a, um, let's say, a procedure that three calls, yes. the person doesn't pick up, does a crisis team get involved? automatically or is it just based on each case? I think you're asking like if we sign someone that's not going to their appointments that we miss say you got discharged from an inpatient service and you missed your appointment at your outpatient clinic um, we make those calls to see yes we have a kind of procedure one there the when the, someone's discharged uh, they may be rated as high risk or moderate risk or right. low risk um, if they're a mid or moderate or high risk and we can't get in touch with them through our follow-up system, then usually we, yes, refer that to mobile crisis. I just want to know if there's anything, like if, if it's a and moderate risk, if it's a if know, we, high if, risk, does the mobile crisis team get involved yes, automatically? Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. And, and regarding the homeless, going back to uh, my colleague's question about reaching out to the homeless, does the crisis team get involved um, with with the homeless uh, situation, obviously they need it. We, we do, it makes it more challenging and difficult. I mean, if it's one of our uh, patients we've treated and they're homeless, 
the homeless situation can make that uh, ability to find the person more challenging and difficult. Oftentimes we work with the, the community-based uh, homeless agencies that go out and are really much more familiar with, with some of the issues related to the homeless. So our mobile team oftentimes partners with them to, to, to reach someone who's homeless. Okay. As I said, our goal really is to try to get someone with mental illness and homelessness into some other kind of uh, setting, whether it be you know uh, supportive housing or something. But yes. All right, just one, uh, maybe you have an observation or, or some thought on this. How, how do we get more volunteer hospitals involved in behavioral health? Is, is there an incentive we can give as the city can, I mean, do you have any ideas on that? Um, well, it's, individual hospitals may have individual issues and, you know, that I don't have a data. I mean, in general, behavioral health services are very important. <laughs> Uh, as we see, uh, sometimes they are, it's, the reimbursement of them are difficult and you have to offset them with other services. Uh, it's hard for me to comment on what other hospitals and have reasons, their data and individuals of why they may or may not be more involved in uh, systems. I think that there are many that certainly are very actively involved. All right, thank you. Hey. Thank you, Council Member Holden. And I just want to point out, I don't think there are any representatives from voluntary hospitals here today. You can correct me if I'm wrong, and you are free to submit a form to testify. Thank you. I would like to go to Council Member Alika Ampri Samuel. Thank you. Hello, hello. Test. Oh. <laughs> it wasn't on before. They're on all the time, just <laughs> FYI. So first, thank you so much for this hearing. Um, about, say, almost 20 years ago, I worked as a discharge planner on an inpatient psych unit. I worked at um, Mary Immaculate Hospital in Jamaica, Queens, before they, well, when they first opened up five new unit, which was a 28-bed um, facility and was hurt when they had to close down. And I think I spent most of my time as a discharge planner looking for organizations and different programs to discharge to outside of the um, partial that we had across the hall. Um, so thank you so much. This is um, very critical. And I also worked on um, the mobile unit with Guided Riverside Project Reach Out a little about 21 years ago. And so, um, it's interesting how we're having this conversation, same conversation 20 years um, later. But I want to go back to Councilwoman Ayala's question related to um, children. I had a young man who um, attempted suicide in the middle school. And my question is really related to H&H &H and its collaboration with Department of Education, as well as its collaboration with the Administration for Children's Services, because I just feel like the system failed um, this young man. He went to school and attempted suicide in the bathroom and was immediately hospitalized and then was um, removed from his parents and then went through the system and was hospitalized for a couple of weeks and from his foster home was just dropped back off with the, like a, a van service directly to the school again. And the school had no idea as to how to be able to be supportive of this young man and they were not able to contact the family anymore and it was just all about the city of New York. And this went on for about several months where the child would be hospitalized, go back to group home and just be dropped back off in front of the school and it was just constant. And the principal and the administration, the teachers were just frustrated with not really having um, like a protocol or system or um, something in place to really be of support and actually know what's going on. So you mentioned um, school-based programs. So can you just elaborate on what that really means and look like in situations where some of our children really are in crisis? Um, but are just shuffling through the system and they don't have that family support or that traditional family support? So Health and Hospitals does operate uh, a number of uh, mental health programs, uh, both mental health and oftentimes health care, primary care, pediatric care, uh, in a variety of schools uh, throughout the city uh, where we provide uh, basically mental health services including assessment, 
uh, it includes uh, ongoing you know, therapy, might be on medication management by the psychiatrist associated with the program, but a lot of times it's therapy uh, with the, the person, the adolescent, the individual in the school, uh, and oftentimes their family. If they're family involved, we encourage you know, to have not only individual sessions, but family sessions when appropriate. Uh, we also actually provide a lot of um, education uh, and support to the school faculty, uh, the teachers, the counselors, uh, all of those we, where we are located in, in any of those, that's, that's a big support that we try to play for that. And we've seen a number of success of, of the, the, the kids coming you know, to these mental health services. Uh, we make them accessible, we make them so they're not stigmatized, so they're somewhat informal, uh, that they can come to the services so that we can have an opportunity to, to provide uh, treatment services for them, but also education services about mental health issues as well. And is that, so is that something that all schools are familiar with? So um, maybe this particular principal of this particular school just didn't know uh, what was available or I don't know like that there kind of I, I don't know that there's a, a formal uh, you know mental health program in every school uh, there are certainly uh, that we have targeted uh, a lot of schools with particularly a lot of issues in uh, known mental health and other substance use and other behavioral problems um, but I certainly think it's a very important program I know that the, the city is certainly looking to increase uh, the number of school-based programs that are available because uh, we do find that does make a difference in providing that support for the children as well as for the, the, the teachers. Okay, and this is my last question. Can you describe how H&H &H links individuals who receive psychiatric care while incarcerated to continued care services once they are released? Because myself and um, Council Member Holden recently did a, a, a visit to Rikers Island and we had just so many questions related to what happens next. I'll, I'll say I'll do the best I can. My colleague who had to leave, oh, she's here. <laughs> this is Dr. Elizabeth Ford. Uh, with correctional health. We want to make sure you get sworn in. Sure, absolutely. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, apologies, I do. I was just about to go, but I, um, your question was about reentry services, I believe, for individuals who are in, detained in the jail system. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Um, so we have, uh, we have a high proportion of, of individuals detained who have serious mental illness and also less severe forms of mental illness. And for each person that the mental health service in the jail treats, we, um, we provide reentry services that run the range from entitlements, housing, treatment services, education and employment opportunities. And it, each of those plans, the discharge plans, is pretty individually tailored for the person's specific needs. And we are connected to multiple community agencies, both within health and hospitals and outside for those people. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Moya. I want to take this opportunity to um, thank uh, the chairs uh, for really uh, doing a wonderful job in, in bringing this uh, hearing together. Uh, Chair Rivera and Chair Ayala, thank you. Uh, this is a problem when you're like batting cleanup. Uh, most of your questions are already answered. Uh, but I just wanted to take this opportunity um, to thank um, my sister, uh, Alina Moran. Uh, we were both uh, National Urban Fellows. I know she was here a moment ago. And uh, we work together at Elmhurst Hospital, and she's doing a tremendous job. And thank you, doctor, for your testimony and everyone who's doing a tremendous job in uh, helping combat uh, these issues that we're facing uh, here in our city. So thank you, Chairwoman, for allowing me uh, just to uh, shout out my sister, uh, Alina, who uh, is a good friend of mine. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moya, uh, for your shout out and your comment. No, it's nice. It's important um, that we, you know, these are everyday heroes. I know that a lot of you are in this room right now. So thank you for being here. Council Member Reynoso. 
Thank you, Chair, uh, Chairs, uh, for this hearing. Um, so just like uh, Councilmember Moya, my wife has uh, just graduated from Baruch for mental health um, in, for a graduate program, so I'm extremely proud of her and happy that I was the test subject or the guinea pig for many of her experiments. <laughs> Um, but she graduated and I think I'm, I'm okay. I think I'm better now than I was when she started the program. Um, sometimes I didn't think I was though. Um, uh, but I, I do wanna ask, related to reimbursement, uh, the money question, because it's always about money. But uh, Health and Hospitals and Dr. Katz has said that they have a plan uh, to get out of this hole um, and this debt that we have in our health and hospital system. Um, the reimbursement is extremely important. And the easier the reimbursement, the more he wants to make sure he's paying attention to it or focusing on it. Mental health is reimbursed much differently than general health, right? Um, and uh, it just doesn't seem like it would be on the top or priority list of where we need to uh, expend resources on hiring, let's say, more mental health um, uh, professionals uh, to be able to uh, supply or, or, I guess, uh, do the work. Uh, if it's not easy to reimburse and if it's not if it doesn't, the, re, the return, I guess, on how much it costs to be, or how much we receive as a city. Um, so I just wanted to ask, uh, is it a top priority? What's the reimbursement method? Just in general, is this gonna be something that we're gonna pay attention to long term or are we just kind of just rolling with it? Well, that's a terrific question. Thank you for letting me answer that. Yeah. Um, Actually, uh, Dr. Katz is very committed to continuing uh, behavioral health services. Uh, he recognizes the importance of these services uh, in healthcare in general, and certainly in New York City particularly. Uh, and he has made a strong commitment to continue these services, uh, to advocate for uh, appropriate reimbursement, and to look for other opportunities as he testified in, I think, the budget hearings in a sense of looking at, you know, our, our current different strategies for uh, revenue management, uh, also looking for other kinds of services that may be having higher reimbursement that are appropriate that would offset our, uh, some of the behavioral health issues. Uh, so he's really made a very uh, long-term commitment to us. And I think the fact that, uh, in, in that we are the main behavioral health provider in New York City I think that commitment is appropriate. So the higher reimbursements, subsidizing the work we do with mental health, that's baked into our plan. Right? Well, that's one of the aspects of that. We're looking at many of our, you know, any, wherever we can improve the, the reimbursement and the collection uh, on mental health services, making sure that anybody who is eligible for benefits, for coverage, uh, that we assist them in helping them sign up to get that coverage. Oftentimes, uh, many of our people with mental illness do qualify for that, but maybe they've not been able to for a variety of issues, including maybe their illness, uh, sign up and achieve that uh, status. So we're certainly part of the program of looking at making sure that everyone who's appropriate is insured, uh, looking at that all of our services are appropriately uh, billed to those insurers, uh, and then also then looking at other areas we can offset some of the other things. Okay, I just wanna make a push and advocate. I know the, this panel uh, most likely agrees that the separation of like physical health and mental health and how they're reimbursed and what they're looked at in relation to, to just general health is, is, is not something that, that we're proud of. Um, I think the federal government is the biggest issue, so I want to be clear that the city council is clear uh, from responsibility regarding the fact that they're treated differently when they should be the same. Um, but that reimbursement is extremely important yes. and for the long-term financial health of this uh, of, of health and hospitals. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page that it is something that's being prioritized um, and it's not being left in the, in the back burner um, because it's not, it doesn't have a higher reimbursement rate. The, the next thing I wanted to ask and the last question is, um, I'm having, I, I have huge issues when the police department is the first responder to most of these mental health issues in the city of New York. And what we're seeing is in a lot of cases, these officers don't know how to properly assess a mental health victim, let's say, um, and end up shooting them um, and killing them uh, for a lack of experience and a lack of education. Uh, to be honest, it shouldn't be the police's responsibility to show up at any, at any situation where there's a mental health person. Um, and a lot of the times these are mostly happening in uh, communities of color as well that are poor communities uh, uh, where people are often misjudged or 
you know, you know, the racial bias that exists in, in a lot of the work that the police department is doing. I heard about these emergency or these uh, mobile units. Is there a, a conversation happening within the administration where they're tying the two together, where we're going to figure out a way that when there is a call made and we hear that it's a mental health person, a uh, person that needs mental health assistance, that maybe we send you instead of the cops? There is a conversation going on that. Actually, there is a, a task force that's just been formed and is meeting uh, with the goal of, of really looking at uh, crisis response uh, to emergency situations. Uh, so we're looking forward. We're part of the task force. Dr. Katz is, is on the advisory committee of that. Uh, and many of our other behavioral health experts are participating in the work groups. So we're looking at how to really best answer some of those questions. Uh, there are a couple of uh, co-response teams uh, already where their mental health professionals go with the police when there's a suspicion of mental illness, uh, which seems to be uh, a successful part. So I think that there is a conversation looking at how to improve that. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to a report or whatever it is that comes out of that. That's an extremely important issue. Again, I want to thank both chairs for this great hearing, and thank you, Dr. Byron, for, for your testimony and the work that you do. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Ayala. Thank you. So I had a, oh, sorry, corrections. I know every time you, you're, you're ready to leave, every time that you're this ready to really, leave. <laughs> this is really the, <laughs> sorry, like the last kids one. We apologize, but the last no question. Um, because you guys are doing work at Rikers Island, mm -hmm. um, and we know uh, and understand really well that not every inmate is getting the attention or the services they require because of the, the issues with the way the facility was built and security. Um, I, I want to understand a little bit better what happens when you have, when you're treating a mentally ill inmate, um, how the, how, is there coordination with the corrections department as it pertains to disciplinary action so that inmates that may be suffering from maybe bipolar disorder or depression are not being put into, you know, solitary confinement as a means of, you know, of punishing them for bad behavior, which should be expected under the circumstances. If you could. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. So um, as of uh, December 31st, 2013, individuals with serious mental illness, such as the bipolar disorder that you mentioned, do not go into solitary confinement or punitive segregation. Um, and we have developed since then um, fairly substantial and very effective alternatives to punitive segregation for individuals with serious mental illness who would have otherwise been there. But as of today, there is not a person with serious mental illness in solitary. Can you elaborate that on jail. that a little bit? What does the treatment look like? Sure. It's a, um, there are units called CAPS, Clinical Alternative to Punitive Segregation, and they started in early 2014. They are treatment units within the jail system that are modeled after inpatient psychiatric units. So they're very richly staffed with both uh, mental health staff as well as steady Department of Correction officers who are trained um, as a team together to take care of the patients. There is as much as uh, confidentiality and protected health information will allow, the, the health staff and the custody staff work very closely together with these patients. They're lock-out models, which means that people are not locked in their cells, um, and it, they, with the exception of being in a jail, they look uh, fairly similar to the care that you would get in a hospital. Okay, I appreciate it, thank you. Sure. And I also want to add that uh, the chair, the, the committee on hospitals, that's chaired by yours truly, and the, I'm all, I also serve on the committee on criminal justice, and we're planning to do a joint hearing on correctional health in October of this year. So thank you for your testimony. Um, just, a, I guess, a couple more questions. I don't know if any of my colleagues have anything further, but just to ask you um, about recruitment. Earlier today, people mentioned Dr. Katz's commitment to hiring more primary care physicians and increasing this network as a way of moving towards prevention rather than intervention because of the move towards ambulatory care. So how is H&H &H dealing with the recruitment of new psychiatrists to care for the patients? in this move of more primary care? Excuse me. Well, uh, we certainly um, advocate the recruitment of psychiatrists whenever we have the availability of needing psychiatrists or vacancies, et cetera. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a national shortage of specifically psychiatrists. 
uh, and particularly in the large urban areas such as New York. Uh, so we are looking at how to better use our psychiatrist that we have uh, and develop a lot of other alternatives. Uh, we really uh, are developing models that use the physician extenders, as we call them, uh, nurse practitioners, psychiatric nurse practitioners, uh, social workers, psychologists, uh, really to work with, uh, as a team, with the uh, physician, the psychiatrist, to provide care. Uh, so that basically the psychiatrist is able to really focus a lot on uh, the kinds of uh, treatment and skills that only the psychiatrist do, such as doing psychopharmacology uh, and doing sort of overall uh, treatment guidance of the, the patient's care. Uh, and then some of the other things like the therapy and other things that are really very important are done by some of our other physician extenders. Uh, we're also developing uh, the, the technology and using the things of tel telepsychiatry. Uh, it's uh, very widely used uh, in the rest of the country, uh, and certainly in certain situations that would be ideal, especially providing consultations uh, to uh, small clinics, uh, to our primary care providers. Uh, so we are developing that model as, as well to provide uh, consultations and treatment using telepsychiatry. It allows us to have uh, the greater service uh, and not be uh, so dependent on the, the shortage of psychiatrists that the country is feeling. I know you said there's a move towards telepsychiatry, but do you think it's effective? It has. Uh, there have been certainly studies and things that have shown that it has been eff effective. Uh, and that also the, our pay, that the patients that receiving that can be very satisfied. A lot depends on how you set it up. Uh, in our model, uh, there will be someone with the patient, like uh, potentially a counselor or a social worker or something of that nature, so that, and the psychiatrist would do that through that. We're experimenting a lot first with consultation, uh, and, and certainly sometimes we have shortages of, say, uh, example, child psychiatrists in our system. Uh, we can use some of our child psychiatrists to provide uh, psychiatric consultation to uh, our colleagues that are on site, our general psychiatrists and, and primary care providers. With the mention of data, I did want to ask, um, in your testimony, you mentioned deploying a system-wide and multi-phase expansion of integrated ambulatory behavioral health care, and that's with an expected completion date of 2020. And I wanted to know, when you're assessing your facilities, um, and determining what kind of services you're going to provide related to social social determinants, if there is any data that you could share with us on that, fully realizing that a lot of it has to remain anonymous to protect people's uh, sensitive information, but if you have any information that could help us in saying how you do facility assessment and service provision related to social determinants, we would greatly appreciate that data. So that's one request from me. And then when you mentioned the national shortage of psychiatrists, I agree, I know that it's a big issue, and even the primary care physician shortage is also a very big issue nationally. So you have, for example, recently the Allen Pavilion at Presbyterian closed, and there was an elimination of behavioral health beds. And so I have reason to believe that you will actually, this hospital itself will be directly affected because of just its geography. So uh, is your hospital prepared to take on that capacity? And when we mention a national shortage, shortage of doctors, how does that impact the nurses that are here and what they're going to in terms of uh, staffing ratios and patients? Well, I think it's, um, well, we're certainly concerned about the, the taking over the capacity and we certainly, I think, would have some challenges uh, in absorbing you know, additional capacity than we already do, uh, but we certainly, our mission is to serve, so we certainly won't turn anyone away. I think our shortages of psychiatrists is, is a concern uh, every day uh, for us is to make sure that we have appropriate staffing levels. Uh, in relation to nursing, you know, we've actually uh, hired a number of nurses. Um, actually, we uh, since I think it's January, we've hired uh, put about 400. And uh, exact number, 450. I think it's 450. Uh, nurses, they're in various stages of onboarding and orientation. There's 60 in the class here in June. Uh, so we recognize that nursing actually plays a very vital role in healthcare and, and in specifically in behavioral health. So we've been making a lot of efforts to, uh, you know, really increase our nursing capacity, et cetera. 
Uh, I think, you know, the shortage of psychiatrists impacts the entire team. In behavioral health, you really, you function as a team. The doctor, the nurse, the social worker, the psychologist, the, the mental health uh, professionals, all of that. We function as a team working with our patients. So it impacts certainly our teams, but I, that's why we've really been developing these other models. And what we have seen with our models is basically a, a lot of success. We see uh, a lot of patient satisfaction. Uh, we see improvement in our patients. Uh, we see uh, also improvement in our satisfaction of our staff as well, uh, that they find this to be a very uh, good model uh, for them to work. Well, I know we're going to hear from the nurses shortly. So I encourage you to stay for all testimony. We don't have uh, a ton of, of people here. so. I really do encourage the administration to stay and, and listen to everyone who's here. Um, so I wanted to just ask whether, I know that we had mentioned earlier the budget and my, uh, my colleague, Council Member Cabrera, had said to let us know how we can be a partner in supporting you as a system and whether there was anything you felt that our committee could do to support your work in bringing resources or visibility or awareness to some of what you're doing and how we can support you serving the majority of New Yorkers who are seeking behavioral health services. If you had any ideas. I, I will get back to you. I definitely okay. may have some ideas, but thank it's, you very much. That's important. Sure. I mean, I want us to honestly, this is not just about your system. Unfortunately, like I said, there aren't uh, voluntary hospitals here, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of questions about their decisions to eliminate behavioral health beds. And we all know when it comes to the bottom line and reimbursements, what services make more money than others. And so we want to make sure that there's equity in the system citywide. And the, the burden is not just on H&H. &H. So if there's not any further questions uh, from my committee members, I have a few more. And I think what we'll do is send them over to okay. you. Um, there's some data driven, again, my request for data on some of the social determinants. Uh, we're going to have the correctional hearing in October, and we plan to dive pretty deep into that. And I just want to thank you for being here and answering all our questions and for uh, holding your own. Just thank you right very there much. On your thank own. you for your support. Oh, you're very welcome. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, and I want to acknowledge Councilmember Powers and put him on the spot and ask if he had any questions. Um, I, have, I have no questions. I congratulate <laughs> you both on doing a, a meeting up, uh, up out, in the, out in the field here. And I actually was a school block away and I wanted to go <laughs> see these two talented chairs in action. So, but I have no questions. Keith, I mentioned you. I said we're having a correctional health yes. joint committee yes. hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Council Member Powers, who has Bellevue Hospital, where I was born. I just want you to know something personal about me. Um, so thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Barron. We're going to move on to testimony from uh, members of the public, and we will be sure to follow up with you in the future, yes. immediately following. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. So I would like to call up uh, Judith Cutchin, registered nurse, Ann Beauvais, registered nurse, and Janine Thomas from DC 37. Okay. Okay. Um, good afternoon, all. Um, my name is Judith Cutchin. I'm a registered nurse. I work at Waterhall Hospital for over 27 years, and I'm an RN for 28 years. I'm also the New York State Nurses Association Executive Council Health and Hospital and Mayoral Executive Council President, representing over 9,000 nurses. First, I want to thank you all for allowing me to address you here today and thank the committees, the chairs of these committees, Ms. Diana Ayala, 
Mark Levine, and Carlina Rivera for highlighting this very, very important issue. I want you to know that we, the 9,000 nurses of the Health and Hospital Corporation and Mayoros, stand ready to work with you to do what we can to stop further exacerbation of the issues that I will discuss and to support the expansion, mental health services, and funding in our hospitals and our facilities. I would like to share some information with you. As you may know, state-run psychiatric facilities in New York began to close in 1982. And state-run facilities with psych beds have declined by 90% from 1982 until the present. This, have been, this has left a severe burden on New York City public hospitals, um, especially a um, health and hospital corporation and some safety net facilities. There are more than 2,840 hospital beds for psychiatric patients at a total of 37 hospitals across the five boroughs. Almost half of the available beds are in the city public hospitals. Three of those hospitals is Bellevue, in Manhattan, Kings County in Brooklyn, that's where I was born, and Elmhurst Hospital. They account for 25% of all psychiatric beds in the city. 30% of all beds in public hospitals for psychiatric patients, while only 8% of all beds in the private system are for psych patients, which is an extremely low number comparing to the public hospital system. Nearly 40% of the adult New Yorkers with serious mental illnesses 95,000 individuals did not receive mental health treatment in 2017. The continual removal of hospital beds and defunding of mental health treatment will only exacerbate this issue. New York State Nurses Association, 1199 Interfaith Medical Center in Brooklyn, Kingsbrook Jewish Medical Center in Brooklyn, students, community groups conducted the 2017-2018 Community Health Study in bed stuy Crown Heights and East Flatbush. The results were very stunning. The number one response to the community's health was housing insecurity. A majority of those surveyed attributed to were unsure if they would afford to live in their homes for another five years. <coughs> You should know that hospitalization rates for mental illness, including schizophrenia and mood disorders, are two times as high in displaced people versus those who remain in their neighborhood. Nearly one million New York City residents are at risk of being priced out of their homes with enormous implications for mental health care needs. This stressor, housing insecurity, is placed in our communities and our patients under massive amount of mental stress. Ending housing gentrification and addressing mental health are immediate needs of our communities. The two issues, they definitely go hand in hand. Mental illness is linked to other illnesses. There is also a strong link between mental health and chronic conditions such as diabetes, cancer, and heart disease, to name a few. Many of our patients are presenting themselves with whole host of illnesses. Mentally ill patients are not coming into our hospitals and facilities for just one condition. Our patients are truly sick. They're coming to the ambulatory set, setting sick. Well, and we need to treat the whole scope of their illnesses, including the mental health. Our government institutions have an obligation to make sure mental health services are fully funded. As previously stated, only 8% of New York City's private hospital beds are for psych patients. Most private hospitals have abandoned the mental health, the insurance companies as well. It is only the safety net facilities, both public and some private, like Interfaith Medical Center and the Health and Hospital Corporation that are doing their part. It is a high time that we work together, city, the state, and at the federal level, to provide safety net institutions with proper funding levels, especially for the lion's share of mental health services that we provide in these communities. There's one final thing to say. We at Health and Hospital are open for care. We want care and care well for all of our patients and the communities we serve. Our doors are open for care, and we need increased adequate funding for mental health safety now, better than later. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Ms. Cutchin, for your comments on housing and how it affects me our mental health as a city and the crisis that we're in. And of course, I have to thank you for your 28 years of service. And at Woodhull. I was going to say, at Woodhull. Woodhull. And Reynoso is. Facility at Woodhull. Thank you very <laughs> the much. Whole, for the whole service. time you've been at Woodhull? And there you go. You so much. That's why she's amazing. I'm sure you've served any number of my family out, out of Bushwick houses. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Anne? Miss um, Bove, excuse me. Yeah. No, I'm, my name is Anne Bove, and um, I recently retired from Bellevue Hospital after a long time of service, just leaving 40 years. Okay. It's on the record as 40. Yeah, it's actually there. Okay. <laughs> I, I did put it there. But it's, it's amazing to me, I, I guess what disturbs me most, a lot of what I have there is a lot of statistical analysis, but that the bulk of behavioral health management and care is done by the public sector, and that the private sector has abandoned it. And it doesn't matter your income. It really doesn't matter your income. It's just the idea of that particular service. When I think of 40 years ago when I started at Bellevue, and I think of um, the services that are provided at Bellevue now, one of the services that I feel that has been lost that really needs to be reinstated is those transitional services, whereby a patient is discharged but still has a connection with the facility to ensure that there's a continuation of treatment modalities necessary to facilitate the care that needs to be done. Um, the, other, the other thing that's also quite disturbing is the fact that in terms of looking at our emergency room um, settings, that there needs to be restructuring in the sense of actually architecturally. Because right when I was retiring, there were 16 people that were out, nursing personnel that were out because of injury in psych emergency. And a lot had to do with the structure of how psych emergency is set up. And diversion is just a word. It's not a reality. So that if, if that emergency room gets you know, over census to like 50 people, they really can't send people away. And you have stretcher on top of stretcher on top of stretcher. I know um, the CEO of the hospital has put forward a capital budget to, to put that change in place. But where it stands now is in, is in this nebulous world that can't be nebulous anymore. Uh, also, another thing that was uh, uh, you mentioned was the idea of handling people. And the idea of crisis management and that crisis management training needs to be throughout the system. Every nursing personnel at Bellevue gets crisis management training. And it's my belief that anybody who deals with the public, NYPD, FDNY, anybody needs that crisis management training. How do you de-escalate de a situation? And, in, and it's, it's my understanding that that doesn't happen in the same way that it's happened at Bellevue. Um, just like BLS, uh, basic life support. You know, you can't just watch a film for four hours and say, you know, that's okay. You have to actually be sure you know how to do it. And it's this idea of de-escalation and the idea of recognizing someone in crisis and understanding how that ultimately impacts. And not only in impacts from a behavioral health standpoint, but the immediate physiologic changes that an individual may have in the process of de-escalation. And that if they do have any critical uh, you know, physical issues like cardiac, et cetera, that they're more prone to show it in that de-escalation phase, um, you know, when they're recuperating, because now their adrenaline is gone accordingly. Um, you know, so I think that there's certain measures that can be done. I'm glad that there is more nursing personnel being hired, but what disturbs me is they let it get to such very difficult numbers and that if, you're, if you are hiring you know, X number, hundreds of nurses for a facility, what's that telling you you left it at? And, like, and I retired a year ago, and they still haven't replaced my position. Who's there to educate? Who's there to be the role model? 
legacy was not considered. And legacy within a, in New York City Health and Hospital needs to be considered because at, in terms of my age bracket and within a 10 year span, a lot of people are gonna be retiring just simply because they aged out. I tried to explain that to leadership in New York City Health and Hospitals, but it wasn't grasped. So um, just to understand that people aren't abandoning the system, when you hit your 60 plus, I won't say age, you know, that's the time you need to now yourself transition. And there's certain physical capabilities that may be challenged for you as well. So in final summary, the idea of early recognition in terms of crisis management, you know, financial support for providing the facility necessary to manage the patients that, that New York City Health and Hospitals sees in a, in a safe and efficient manner. And, and just, you know, planning ahead, not doing catch up in terms of providing those resources. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bobay, for your years of service and for your testimony, which actually has a lot of um, information on recent beds that have been eliminated in the voluntary network. Just one point on Allen Pavilion. Sure. That got postponed for one year because they did hire and renew the visit, but that doesn't. But that's just one year. It, what's going to happen after that year? You know, we're not forgetting. And, and that's, that community needs to have that service. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Janine Thomas. I am a council representative for District Council 37. I've been involved with the union since 1981. I've worked with the New York City Police Department, Rikers Island, and Health and Hospitals. Um, I don't have a speech but I was taking notes about a lot of things that were said. The issue, there is a shortage of psychologists and psychiatrists in the hospitals, but you have other staff members that can um, help the patients. Um, the problem is everybody knows is funding. The hospitals that I cover, I've covered Woodhall, I've covered Harlem, and I've covered Lincoln Hospitals and the behavioral health in all of them. They are terribly short staff. Sometimes you have a 20 to 1 ratio with one person watching 20 patients. The vision of health and hospitals that I read is for the behavioral health department to have a therapeutic environment so that you would decrease recidivism. That is impossible when you have a staff that cannot really therapeutically attend to the patients because they're short staff. So what you have is a type of thing where patients just come in for crisis, they go out. Uh, most of the social workers that I cover, I cover many titles, have shared with me that they only have time to do an exit as one of uh, my sister here um, testified that she used to work in um, discharge planning. They tell me that's the bulk of what they can do. So you don't have on a large scale, the patients getting connective outreach. You have a little bit of that in Harlem and it's being successful. I even hear some patients on the elevator say that they like that, but on a full scale, you don't have that. With that, you have the Rikers Island. I was with them when they went through the change when Mayor de Blasio's wife uh, decided that, you know, mental patients should be not criminalized, but seen another way. So now you have a different culture coming into the hospitals. You have more injuries of the staff. They're being injured. Uh, the forensic units are not being used to move the violent patients to other facilities like Bellevue, which is great for that. So you have a lot of things going on. I truly believe, looking at the glass half full, that it can be done. But with the staffing levels the way it is, when you have one person watching 20 patients, there are even some patients that come in, they're not really in crisis, they just need a break from life. Uh, the situation that they're put in because of the atmosphere doesn't even help them get well, they complain as well. So without the staffing, without them moving to hire, not just nurses and psychologists, but you have other titles. You have BHAs, which they hired so that could keep the hospital police out of treating patients like uh, criminals. You have a very short um, staffing level with them. 
Um, and so the staffing level means a lot. I, I have to say it again, staffing, staffing, staffing. Because when you don't have people that can report to the psychologists that deal with the patients on an everyday basis, and they don't even have time to record the patient's actions, pretty much what's happening with the patients is presumptuous therapeutic uh, care. And so I live in the city and I work for the union and I'm very much concerned about the decrease in recidivism plus, last point, um, when you don't take care of mental health care, uh, because now it's in every department in the hospital, it's just not in behavioral health. You have folks coming in different places and you begin to see that they have these mental issues. When you don't take care of the hospital, it spills outside. And so now in front of the hospital, you have the homeless, you have the mental ill, and when they are, get hungry or cold or tired, they do stuff so that the police can arrest them. They know they're not going to jail, and they come in, and now you have a whole other situation where you're cre creating a hostile environment inside the hospital and out. So with everybody looking at this, it's a good thing because New York City uh, really needs it, but um, staffing, 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 staffing. You are not having a therapeutic environment. You're not having things get better. What you're doing is you're just moving people in and moving them out, and after 10 years, we're, we're gonna be uh, worse off. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas, for your multi-borough service as well and for bringing up staffing. We know how important it is, and I'm glad to see a lot of nurses and nurse representation here. So are there any other members of the public who can, wish to test? Oh, yeah, sure, actually. Sure, sure. Any council members have yeah. questions for the panel, please? Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. This testimony from all three of you was so powerful and so necessary. Uh, I'm really glad that, that you came and spoke out. Um, I wonder if any of you can talk to us about the numbers here, the number of nurses or, or other staffing titles today compared to years past. Um, what are the trends? Are we losing headcount or is it just that we have a larger patient load? Does anyone have numbers on that? Well, I don't have, I don't have exact numbers. I don't know if you need, I don't have exact numbers, but it just seems, you know, the, 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 what, what the deal is is that you're looking at ratios that are starting to go backwards, not forwards. And what about that? So can you compare the ratio today, which I think you said was 20 to 1, which sounds really high. What would that have been 10 years ago or any, any history on the trend with that? Well, well, 10 years ago, it would have been better. It would have been like 1, one to 8, 1 to, my goodness. you know, like that. And, um, and the, the, the real issue, lie in, in my, what I've seen from a union standpoint, because before I retired, I was the local bargaining unit president for Bellevue, as well as um, I, was the, I was Judith's predecessor in terms of HHC, New York City Health and Hospitals. And the idea of safety is a huge concern. Um, yeah. You know, if you have an overcrowded emergency room, not even if it's behavioral health, but an overcrowded emergency room, everybody in there isn't because they just decided one day to go la-di-da-di-da, -di -da. they're in crisis. So subsequently, you need to provide an environment that is going to be as safe as possible for all those individuals. And what really struck me um, the last time I was down there was that stretcher was next to stretcher, next to stretcher, and it was a flu season. So my, my background is critical care, med surge. So you know that my eyes are going to look in in that direction initially, but you know communicable diseases and and when a patient comes in, and they're in crisis, they need to have space where they can be on a one to one and be de-escalated. And if you look at the setup at Bellevue right now, it needs to be revamped, and th the fact that 16 people, nurses. BHAs, people that had direct contact with the patients didn't have those resources and were hurt. And, and it wasn't little hurt. It was like, you know, something got broken, you know, massive tissue damage, et cetera. Well, that that sound, it really sounds terrible, and it is related to staffing levels. But do, do you know, either Ms. Ms. Bove or Nurse Colchin, how many NYSNA members you have at H&H &H working in behavioral health? No, 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 Okay, I think we'd probably be very curious if you can get back to us Those with numbers. that number and, and particularly if you could compare that to years past. It would be very disturbing if the headcount was dropping at a time when the need is increasing. And I wonder, yes, the same question for DC 37, yeah. 
that, that human resources tells us is that even if you're going to hire, it takes about six months to really vet out and, and find out if the person is qualified. Um, the other thing is the culture in the hospital with the patients is changing. When the city and everyone decides that they're going to make something important like mental health, then that brings in a whole wave of folks that you never dealt with before. So now you have an increase in the population of the patients coming in the hospital. And although I've heard that DOH has been trained and they're trying to train, train police, what's happening is H&H &H for some reason has been left out in the restructuring. So we're catching up to something that's probably new in other places, but we're dealing with the old stuff. So even if you was to look at the statistics, they're not including the new population that is coming in. So that's, that's a problem because you have them with a ratio from the past, but not to the present. And then they're, they're decreasing beds, not according to the need, but according to the money. And so you have a lot of this going on and we need a fresh look. Someone to take a real time fresh look at what's coming in and the staffing levels. Again, even if you have psychologists and psychologists and Nisner, which I love, you still need the, the, the floor folks. You have other titles that are therapeutically there to tell the psychiatrist, even if there's two, what's going on. But they don't even have time to record, you understand, what's happening with the patient on a daily basis. All right. Again, in addition, the needs of the staffing has increased because the acuity level of the patients has also increased. We get it now, I'm ambulatory, and I get a lot of patients that are coming in now for the first visit, and they're also psych. After you do the assessments, we do have what we call the PHQ-9, and it asks individual psychiatric questions, suicidal, or if you're homicidal, or those things, and you'll be surprised of what the patients are answering. And sometimes they'll say, I had chest pain, but when you finish the conversation with them, it's all mental health and it's unrelated to chest pain because they needed to, to talk. And, with, and then the private hospitals, you know, a lot of them closed, their beds decreased. So now the need for the nursing staff, ancillary staff, and social work, and every other staff is also increasing. So thank you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Chair. Can, uh, just one more. The elephant in the room for me is also the affiliation, the physician, the you know, multidisciplinary approach. I talked to you about crisis management classes and putting the nursing staff all levels of nursing staff through it. At Bellevue, the physician group in psychiatry is not participating on a level of any, of any substance that shows their involvement in that. And I think that what needs to be looked at further is the affiliations, accountability, and responsibility in terms of the delivery of care. And I can't, I, I can't speak to, I can't speak to you with more fervence in terms of that. I can't tell you specific incidences because of the fact that, that you know, they were, you know, they're, you know, they're counseling, grievance, whatever, but there's been situations where nurses have been, you know, charged with things that weren't true, pushed aside, and, you know, to cover up for certain things that house staff has been accountable for. Okay, thank you again, and thank you, Chair. Yeah, so it sounds like we could actually double the staff, uh, that we need to do that in, in some of these hospitals. Um, are you seeing, uh, because you show you're uh, short on staff, do you see that the doctors are prescribing medication instead in, in sort of warehousing or just, um, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I don't, it's not so much what I hear from the nurses in psychiatry, it's not the issue that they're ordering more medications but they're not necessarily ordering the right medications and, and not really addressing what the patient's behavioral needs are. And the length of stay has diminished significantly. I'll give you an example. Somebody's depressed, okay? When they're depressed where they need to be hospitalized, they don't have the energy to carry out a plan that they may have for, you know, formulated in their brain about doing themselves in. They come to the hospital. They get medication, they get strength, but they don't get the right continuance of the therapy necessary that would then not have them thinking 
on, on the process, on the, on the pathway to, to do themselves in. So now they're discharged early. And then the end result is they a very have, they negative. They the same problems. And so. Yeah, and they, or they're successful in terms of taking out what their initial plan of action was. So I think part of the deal also is to look at what is the plan of care. And how do you sustain that more from a central, central office type of framework? You have, central, you, have, you have these central line bundles so that you don't get central line infections. And that comes out of the corporate office. It comes out of a central agency. Why can't the same be done for behavioral health in regards to that? The question you asked is very complicated. Um, it, from facility to facility, you'll get a different answer. There are some hospitals that get more money for not medicating. So that could drive something. But the, other, the flip side of that is that there were a lot of more injuries to the patients and to the staff. Um, that therapeutic word that we keep using, that is almost non-existent. We, we really need to, as a city, look at that. Because if we're just housing patients, then we're not doing really any service. And that's what this is becoming. It's becoming a, uh, an agency that is overwhelmed, and so we're just going to house folk, and, and that's what it's becoming. Thank you. 